Hello everybody and thank you for attending to this presentation. Today I'm going to talk about a pilot site that we are establishing along the Clory River in France. Uh, it is uh, funded by the local water agency, Agence de l'eau Rameuse, but also uh, by the CNRS through the long-term ecological research uh, platform network. First, I will talk about the study area and give you the reasons why uh, it is interesting for us to be there. Then I will show you some preliminary results on the chemical contamination, but also its potential uh, toxicity on the ecosystem, starting with biofilm, uh, which plays a key role in these ecosystems. And then I will conclude on the usefulness of our data uh, for the end users of the river. The Clary River is uh, located in the Vosges mountain in uh, eastern France, and uh, more precisely, it is, uh, the source is located close to the lake of Gérardmer, a highly touristic place, uh, very nice for hiking and sightseeing. The Clary River is a typical forested headwater stream of about 20 kilometers long uh, that uh, reaches the Moselot River and then the Moselle and then ultimately the Rhine. Close to the source, it goes through a natural 2000 peatland. Uh, so, so far, so good. Although you may say that the name of the peatland, the Morte Femme or Dead Woman, is not really appealing. Now, let's have a look on the water. Do you notice anything in particular? Maybe this. Uh, bluish coloration at the surface of the water? Well, actually, it can be much more than that. This is a real image, and uh, this is quite evocative. It could be a, a painting by Claude Monet, but it is not. This color comes from uh, several wastewater treatment plants, uh, which release uh, water from several textile factories directly into the peatland. Actually, the Vosges region has a long tradition of uh, made in France uh, textile industry. Uh, it has been declining a lot uh, over the last decades, uh, but it remains uh, one of the last source of um, employment uh, in the region, especially in this valley. Uh, so it makes this case quite sensitive from a socio-economic point of view. Uh, this contamination is uh, legal, but uh, because it's happening in a natural protected area, and uh, there are some fishing activities uh, downstream the river. Uh, the local population uh, start to complain uh, through a, a collective of association. They complain to the local authorities, but also to the water agency, which is in charge of the monitoring of the water quality. So we do have here a typical case study of environmental controversy involving end users, local population, fishermen, uh, but also the media, because it has been quite some uh, press coverage uh, at the local, but also regional and sometimes national level, and also stakeholders, including the water agency, uh, according to the biomet monitoring uh, survey of the river, which is performed a little bit more uh, downstream. Uh, there is Apparently, no problem. So they came to us in order to investigate this case. So our questions are the following. First, we wonder what is happening there. And then we wonder how to position our work within the controversy. And uh, in particular, we wonder how it will be perceived uh, by the different actors. And finally, we wonder how we will be able to generalize our findings. To do so, we set up an uh, interdisciplinary approach uh, with different colleagues from uh, chemistry, ecology, ecotoxicology, and also social sciences. Now, what about the chemical contamination? And uh, let's start with the obvious. Uh, so the, the blue color is due to the presence of fluorescence uh, whitening agents. Uh, they are highly hydrosoluble molecules, mainly of the Stilben family, and they are routinely used in the textile industry uh, as it has the ability to absorb UV and remit the uh, fluorescence in the blue regions, uh, so it makes uh, the white looks whiter. We are uh, working on the, on the method in order to quantify uh, those molecules in the water. 
uh, using uh, synchronous uh, fluorescent spectrometry. Uh, so on the right side, you can see the typical spectra that we can get uh, from the different samples collected along the river. Uh, so in a red uh, sample uh, collected upstream, the wastewater treatment plant, and in green, uh, a sample collected after the contamination. So the main difference between the two is the appearance of uh, this uh, huge peak of fluorescence, which is typical of uh, uh, whitening agent. So we don't have yet uh, absolute values, uh, but uh, we are pretty sure that uh, it will be quite high in comparison to usual environmental concentration that have been reported so far, up to four uh, micrograms per liter. So what we also observed is a really high variability of this uh, signal, fluorescent signal in the water. Uh, so on this figure, you can see the maximum uh, fluorescence intensity in the sample uh, over the three sites and uh, over time. And its variability is due to hydrology. Uh, this is a small stream that responds really fast to rain events. And it is also due to the, the activity of the factories, uh, which can change a lot uh, within a week, but also within a day. So we plan also to fingerprint the overall dissolved organic matter using high resolution uh, mass spectrometry. What about the pesticide now? Uh, well, we have a cocktail uh, uh, dominated by glyphosates and uh, AMPA. Uh, glyphosate concentration can reach up to two micrograms per liter, close to the uh, contamination source uh, indicated here in red. And for AMPA, it can be roughly 100 times uh, higher. So in blue, uh, this is the sampling uh, point close to the monitoring station of the water agency. So they are quite high, but uh, still remain below the environmental quality standards. So why glyphosate and AMPA? Well, glyphosate comes from uh, the fibers uh, that are collected uh, in Asia and uh, where they are probably heavily uh, treated uh, with uh, pesticides before uh, harvesting. And uh, the spinning uh, uh, step also is done in Asia, and then uh, the fibers are uh, imported uh, in France, where uh, the uh, cleaning step and then uh, the whitening step uh, is performed. And for the AMPA, well, it's the main degradation product of glyphosate, but it is also uh, commonly used in, the, in the, this uh, industry as a uh, cleaning agent. So we also looked at other uh, priority substances using passive sampling, and we could detect uh, many other molecules, but at much uh, lower concentration. To summarize uh, this chemical contamination, uh, we do have a cocktail of molecules dominated by uh, whitening agents and glyphosate and AMPA. And uh, of course, the presence of uh, glyphosate amplifies the actual controversy. So it is also chronicled and episodic, and it is moderate uh, according to the environmental uh, quality standards, uh, but it makes uh, this river among the most polluted ones in uh, Eastern France, at least, and so it is significant enough to be questioned by end users. The next step is to characterize the potential ecotoxicity of this contamination. And among the results we have, I will briefly talk about the diatom community structure. Um, regarding diversity, it doesn't seem that this uh, contamination has a strong effect on the taxonomic composition, but we also had a look on the deformations of diatom. So diatoms have an exoskeleton made of silica uh, that can be deformed. Uh, depending on the species, they are more or less fragile and uh, it seems to be a good indicator for uh, heavy metal contamination, but it is less clear for pesticides. In our case, uh, looking at the evolution of the relative abundance of this deformation within the community uh, along the river, uh, we have no deformation upstream the contamination source, and then a sudden increase, and then a continuous decrease 
uh, further away the contamination source. So it seems to work for now, uh, but it is less clear depending on the year and the period of the year, because those species that are more susceptible to, to be deformed uh, can be replaced by other, more robust, uh, but uh, independently of the toxic pressure. Uh, actually, the hydrology uh, can be a strong uh, confounding factor. We also uh, look at uh, potential pollution-induced community tolerance uh, using a PICT approach, and uh, here focus on the glyphosate. And uh, so briefly, uh, we collect sample uh, along the river from upstream to downstream uh, the contamination, and then in the lab, we expose the samples to a range of concentration of glyphosate during a couple of hours, and uh, we monitor the photosynthetic activity and the s rays activity. From uh, uh, each dose response curve, we then uh, estimate the EC50, which uh, is our indicator of uh, tolerance. So these are our first results regarding s rays activity. And as you can see, it's pretty clear. We do observe an increase of tolerance between uh, from upstream to downstream the contamination source indicated here by the red line and then a, a decrease of tolerance a few kilometers away, probably due to dilution of the toxic pressure. Regarding photosynthesis, uh, it was uh, much less uh, conclusive um, because of a really high viability, and uh, well, we still have to improve the methodology. To conclude, uh, let's come back to our initial questions. So of course, this is only the beginning, but we will get more results in order to be able to explain what is happening there. We uh, wonder how these results will be perceived by the different actors, especially when you talk about uh, tolerance to glyphosate and deformations of organisms, even though it, it doesn't necessarily affect higher trophic levels. And uh, to do so, uh, we will work with colleagues from the Social Sciences Department, uh, which will help us to track the circulation of the scientific knowledge that we will provide between the different actors involved in this controversy. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>